Today on the USFL podcast for a special interview as we kind of lead into season two right on the horizon for those that are tuning in for this latest episode of the show. I, I thought we'd bring on some on someone that's been highlighting, I think, some of the potential, uh, I'd say, prospects for you know awards for some possible players that'll be, I think, rising above and beyond for season two. And someone that's been covering the league, I think, pretty well for Fox Sports over the last two, last year plus for the USFL. Uh, I'm bringing on Eric D. Williams, NFL and USFL writer for Fox Sports today to discuss this and much more about the league. Eric, I appreciate you taking your time. Thank you for joining the show. And again, like I said, I love the work you've been doing for Fox Sports on their website. Uh, it's been great. I love reading up on your predictions and thoughts on the league um, and glad to have you on here today. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me, Zach. Appreciate it. Uh, the list has been fun. It's been it's been pretty good engagement on social media, and also just kind of remind people of, of who some of the top players were last year, and, and some kind of names to look for again this season. Right, and I think let's just dive into that. La just talking about a season two. You know, I think for yourself, you know. For, for those that have been following along, Eric's been putting together uh, MV. We basically been putting previews of, you know, potential MVP candidates, offensive defensive player of the year candidates, and much more as the league news has come along. Um, and I think this year is fascinating for these predictions because, you know, unlike say last year where you're kind of going off, you know, we go off some kind of the, the schools and kind of the, at least the accomplishments of these players and what might be. Now you have a whole list of guys that are pro athletes that you can kind of say, you know, much like an NFL season, you're going, all right, I know what I should be getting out of this guy. And I can put that into the mix of kind of just think about who might excel or folks that maybe got their season cut short. Like for example, uh, a DeAndre Johnson, who's on your MVP list that to me, I can see may having a massive leap with Mike Riley's system this year, because he is the quarterback in that system this season. Yeah. No, Luis Perez to share reps with now he can kind of be the guy, although Kyle Lowett is there. So True. Maybe he gets into a rep sharing uh, with that person. But you're right. I mean, uh, past performance is usually a pretty good predictor of future performance. And so now we have last season to kind of look at and look at the numbers and, and try to kind of, you know, take a look and see what they might do for the future. So, you know, somebody like Scooby Wright, who played well last season but was hurt, did miss some games, but made some impact plays, certainly in the championship game. We all remember the, the interception return for a score that really kind of sealed that game for the Stallions. Mm -hmm. So you wonder, Scooby now in that system for a second season, uh, can he make a, a jump in production? Can he stay healthy uh, and be a, a factor in the defensive play of the year uh, award? Yeah, and Scooby, I mean, that that's someone I think that you got to have your eyes on. Obviously, you have your eyes on for defensive player of the year candidates. I'm going to go through your list, and we'll kind of – obviously, we'll jump across all three of them that you've made. Uh, your most recent one's defensive player of the year that came – came out uh, just yesterday as we're recording. So uh, perfect timing for the show, by the way, just have to put that out there. Um, but let's, let's just jump, jump into the MVP one. And I think, I think this one was a great one to kick off. Just kind of, you're talking social media engagement um, that it, any league, you know, you're talking I mean, NFL for yourself, of course, that, that's a big mm -hmm. one. People want to know that right away. And it's awesome that season two, you know, we have some candidates here that I definitely, like I said, Deandre Johnson's mine, that I have that I'm eyeballing case cook is who many people thought last year for the all USFL awards. He had a shortened season and now he gets a full, well, shortened season is in. He came in late after replacing Brian right. Scott, but like in voting aspects that might've affected his status, but now you see how he's playing. And this is a guy that with a full year under his belt, that's a legitimate MVP threat right there. No doubt. And he's coming in as a starter. As you said, he's not playing behind Brian Scott, who was, the starter for the stars initially uh, got hurt, had a knee injury, and then, you know, was done for the year. And then Case Kukas just kind of took off. So now he's the guy. Um, so certainly expectations are high, but there's also the factor that people in the league know what he can do. So now our defense is going to change the way that they they scheme and try to stop him. You know, he's, he's a pretty decent runner. So maybe a little faster than people anticipated. He had this 79-yard run for a touchdown. So I wonder if defenses are going to be more 
uh, ready for him to, to, to make plays with his feet and take that part of his game away. Um, but certainly accurate passer, a clutch performer, you know, seemed to play better when the, when, you know, the game mattered most, uh, certainly somebody that we're going to, you know, be keeping an eye on. Mm-hmm. I, I think, I think for him, that's what a lot of people expect is he's going to, as long as he recovered fine from his broken leg in the championship, which it seems like, you know, all things went smooth that he can continue his pre- progress. And it's not like his receiving core is going to be down in the dumps or anything. It's a lot of the returning guys. And you actually highlighted one player that I think a few people, myself, I was actually surprised. I get, I get why he's on here is Corey Coleman. Who's on mm-hmm. the Philadelphia stars is on your MVP list. Um, and actually out of the MVP list on here, he is the one newcomer on yours in particular. Uh, how do you, what do you, what do you like about Corey Coleman? Um, obviously you've seen him in the NFL. He's had potential yeah. that I've seen in the NFL. What do you like about him coming in his first year in the USFL? I just think it's the talent, you know, it's a former NFL first round pick Fred Bolitnikoff award winner. I think we remember seeing him at Baylor A guy made plays all over the place. Didn't go how he wanted to in the league. Now he's kind of back trying to reestablish himself. So you just figure a guy with that talent level is going to figure out a way to make plays in this league. Um, similar to Kevontae Turpin last year and the kind of talent that he had at, at TCU. So um, we'll, we'll see how he, you know, gets established in that offense and see if he can get going early. Yeah, I have high hopes for him. I think a lot of Stars fans do. But boy, it's going to be... Uh, no matter what, that that roster, that specialty unit in Philadelphia, so many receiving talents too, with Jordan Sewell coming back, Deon, mm-hmm. Deontay Overton coming back as well. I mean, you know, they're gonna have Bug Howard. I can't even skip Bug Howard, one right. of the best tight ends <laughs> in the league. It, it's hard because I mean, I can keep going with their list too. Matt Colburn, Colburn in the Colburn backfield turning in the backfield. Yeah. And Dexter Williams, who had a massive impact yeah. in the championship game. And a pretty good offensive coach in, in Andrews who knows too. what to do with those guys and, and how to get them in space. And so, yeah, I, I think they're going to put up a lot of points. I think it's a great segue into our your offensive players of the year candidates because Colburn is on that list. So might as well go with that. And I mean, honestly, Darius Victor, I think, is going to have a lot more challenges this season, uh, mm-hmm. not only because, you know, I think there's some great runners in the league, but I feel like the passing numbers year two, I think a lot of people are expecting – that you're going to see the passing go up and you're going to see more offense because these systems and the beauty of a second year is that guys like a Bart Andrus, guys like a Skip Holtz, and especially a Mike Riley, they have guys that are season two players that are in their system. They know already what they need to do going into camp. There's no adjustment period. It should be pretty close to a smooth transition this season into week one. And I think they can get deeper into those playbooks and, and start getting more installations because the guys already know the base play. So you're right. I mean, they're kind of hitting the ground running where last year they were really trying to establish their identity as an offense and, and who they were going to be. So, yeah, maybe we will see more passing and more points, which I'm all for that. Mm-hmm. I'm very, I think any football fan is right. right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, look, I, points I, better. I, absolutely. You know, and I, I mean, that's, that's for that's for any any of these new leagues that have popped up or in the NFL for crying out loud. I mean, fans, you know, it's funny. We I think a lot of times when we talk about like the USFL, a lot of folks we relate it to the NFL a lot because that's just kind of the thing. And people want to see high scoring, people want to see that offense explosion, you know, and that's gonna be to me, I think, another extension of that this year. And I love the point on the playbooks, by the way, because you know, the easiest way to get acclimated four players that are coming in is to give them stuff that they can kind of, I guess, digest much quicker so Mm -hmm. that there's less of the technical aspects get screwed up. You know, you're not missing a pole block. You're not missing a hole. You're supposed to hit because you misread. You're not, you know, an RPO is not getting completely bobbled because you don't know which way you're going. You're running into your own running back, you know, routes aren't being, being misrun, you know, all these elements there can be smoothed out to start. Yeah, no doubt. You got more practice time on the field. So I think that's a big deal. Um, you know, as a coach, they can only go as far as the the guy that 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 knows the offense the worst. You know, mm-hmm. that's so you, that's what you're operating out of. So if, if you have everybody on there on all 11 that that know the offense well, then you can add more to it and and, and you can have more inventory and I think that makes you more dangerous. So, um you know, we some pretty good running backs come back too now. I mean, you know, Mark Thompson, Reggie Brown, 
Um, some, some guys that have a lot of success, Trey Williams along with Victor. Um, so I do think there's going to be balance in the league as well because when you have that, that strong running element along with the addition of uh, quarterbacks that can make plays. Absolutely. Let me run through your offensive players fully. I I didn't I know I I didn't fully totally set that out there. Colburn is on that list. That's how he transitioned here. Uh, mm-hmm. Darius Victor once again, which I mean that shouldn't be a surprise. I think you can definitely see him continuing to have continuing to churn those thick thighs down the field very much this season. <laughs> um, my man Reggie Corbin, which I'm glad you listed on this show, and a few of us. Panthers fans, we actually have a question for you. Uh-oh. Why do you, do you think Reggie Corbin could be a dark horse in your list to be an MVP? Because we think he can be in that list too, as maybe a number six, yeah. like you had Ruben Foster in your yeah. defensive list. Yeah, I, I think so because I think he's getting a lot of touches. Just just knowing knowing Mike Nolan a little bit, having covered him when he was the head coach for the Niners and a defensive coach for the Chargers, he's a guy that's going to want to run the football and mm-hmm. and have balance. And, and, and kind of play that time management game and keep his defense on the field. And what better way to do that to get the ball to Reggie? Uh, so, yeah, he could, he could be guy to get a lot of touches. I'm, and he's going to be light, lighting it up. He's been great for the Panthers last year. A few others, and I, I think these are great receiver examples in the league. Obviously, Marlon Williams, who to me is going to get even more targets than last year because you're not having Victor Bolden or you know Cyrus Mitchell, who's on Memphis now. And then Johnny Dixon, which you know I'll be honest with you, I think out of – all these options on this offensive list, you know, the breakers last year, I felt kind of got themselves kneecapped based on their QB position with injury. I mm-hmm. wonder, because you mentioned Mikhail Benthel or McLeod Benthel Thompson on this list too. If he starts and he's healthy throughout the season and is like he is in the CFL, that could be its own debate on who it is just because that offense might step up a level with John Filippo. I think he's the X factor. And I think that's the sleeper team in my opinion. New Orleans because they were they were good defensively. Uh, they could score offensively, but they were a little inconsistent, you know, week to week. But you bring in a veteran like that that's had all that success in the CFL. I imagine he's going to have great command of that offense. Um, and, and and with the playmakers that they have on offense, um, I think they're a team that that could really light up the scoreboard uh, just because of the, the the quarterback play that I'm expecting from a, a player that you know that, that's played as, as much as he has. Uh, John DeLafippo De is a good offensive mind, uh, had success in the league, you know, goes to Philadelphia, goes to the Bears, and now is looking for an opportunity to be the head guy. Uh, so I, I really – and the Breakers were in the playoffs last year. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's that's a team that can maybe take that next step. Yeah, they. I think either way, we we might be – we might have been wondering how much of a step they could take. Because I'll be honest with you, and this is – I want to ask you this too, just because – the QB battles in this, unless you're like a, a QB, like a, like a, like say a case Cookus or even like mm-hmm. a DeAndre Johnson, like a Jamar Smith, although Alex Magoo is sounds like from what you understand is going to be taking snaps too this year. I mean, yeah. do some of these decisions, do you kind of sit and pause because you're like, well, some of these QB battles are kind of big, like the breakers, you know, I, I like MBT as we acronym, but I mean, Akil glass has a huge yeah. pedigree in the HBCU scene. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it's hard, like you said, because um, you don't know how long of uh, a rope the guy's going to have in terms of being out there and being able to make some mistakes. You know, is it going to be two weeks? It's going to be four weeks, especially if there's a, a backup behind him that, that maybe the coaches want to see because, you know, it's, it's about winning, obviously, number one, but it is about development as well. Mm-hmm. Guys want to get their film. And so that's why you see a lot of quarterbacks get, you know, time. Um, so it does it does make it hard. Uh, I think Kenji Bahar is another guy maybe to watch out for for Houston. Uh, they had a three-way uh, battle for that uh, starting job. Kenji's getting it to start, but there's going to be some other guys that are going to be putting some pressure on him. So maybe that's another guy to look for. But but you're right. I mean, I, I think, you know, besides guys like Case Kukas, who we know is just going to be the man probably unless he gets hurt, there's going to be a lot of back and forth, I would think, just like last year. You, you, my co-host might not be on this talk with you, but you just made him the happiest man saying, watch out for Kenji Bahar because <laughs> of us having to worry about facing each other's teams week one. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just telling you, although I'm strong on Carson strong or Josh, yeah. Yeah. I I have no qualms about either one of those gentlemen running my yeah. offense. <laughs> Carson, big, strong guy. I can sling it. Yeah, I can mm-hmm. see that. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, 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 like I said, I think this list, the list of guys, you know, like I said, I'm just running down because I love talking this league, but I think so many of the possibilities for season two kind of get highlighted in a lot of what you're putting together here with these players. Cause I mean, again, we talk about just the second year leap, you know, as well. So mm-hmm. it's just something to keep an eye out for. Um, one other, li- one other list, like I said, the one that you kind of tied all things together and made it convenient for us to talk today um, as well that I, I'm glad we got out is the defensive player of the year candidates. You mentioned Scooby Wright um, and a few other of these. I'm, for example, Chang Stribling had a great conversation with him. I love him. He's a great player. One of the best ones in the league got re-signed, I think, in the offseason to mm-hmm. have back in their talent pool. Uh, Shalom Luani, same deal. Excellent player for Mike Riley's defense and really anchored it down. Frank Frank Ginda, I'm glad you listed him off. <laughs> I, I, I was like, yes, thank thank you. Definitely deserves some recognition. There's some dogs on that on that uh, side, and then Reggie Howard as well. That I think was a good highlight too. Yeah. Um, and I, I'll tell you, I think it like like we said, just to reiterate, I think for these guys, you know, they're still gonna they're gonna be even more expertise on the defensive side for what their coordinators want, but it will be harder for them because of those offensive numbers to me going up and players getting down what they need to get down right away. I think that's a factor. And then I think, you know, I think they're, what do you have? 45 active. It seems like injuries were a concern week in, mm-hmm. week out, and just having a number of healthy bodies out there. So it is going to be kind of a war of attrition and really who can stay healthy through 10 weeks and take care of their bodies and not get caught into bad situations. And, you know, mentioned Scooby Wright, he missed, you know, three games, you know, Howard, I think he missed some games as well. Uh, so really the, the players that are able to get out there, snap in, snap out and, and play consistent, I think are going to be the ones that are going to be vying for, you know, defensive player of the week, year awards at the end of the year. Right. And I, I think, like I said, th- this to me, I feel like the defensive side, you know, I, I, I think that, like I said, there's a lot of, a lot of return candidates, but I think to me, and maybe I'll be wrong. I have a personal opinion. I think the defensive side will find a lot more newcomer talents that mm-hmm. will be a lot more. You'll see in by the early season going will show up. Mm-hmm. And that's no offense to the guys like Scooby Wright or like a Stribling or a Luani. I just mm-hmm. feel like there was a lot of good defensive talent that turned over and did go NFL or did go alternatives, if you mm-hmm. will. And I think that side's going to fill, for example, the gamblers. I mean, you, how much can you say that? I've been talking all offseason. They lost a ton of good talent, but that's because yeah. those guys went up. So, right. you know, someone out of Houston is going to definitely shine to get their second chance because they have to be the next man up or fill in spots that were talented folks last year. Yeah. Like you said, somebody has to step in and, and fill the void. Uh, they have a couple linebackers. I'm blanking on their names. That coach Johnson spoke highly. I've actually talked to Johnson. Was Johnson earlier today? Uh, the defensive lineman too, Raheem, uh, that mm-hmm. he that he, he thought could make it be a guy that could make some plays. Uh, Rutledge at safety, um, and it's Jeremiah Johnson, cornerback. Uh, so there's some players there that that can kind of step up and, and maybe you know try to replace some of that production. But you're right. I mean, those are NFL talented players that you're missing, and guys like Chris Odom and, and Donald Payne. Um, and so it's just it's hard to replace that kind of talent. Um, so you kind of have to do it by committee mm-hmm. for season two as a whole. We, I, you and I have just talked a bunch about, I think kind of the importance of that second year getting in players, returning, getting that second year in the system, getting the second year with playbooks and certain teams. Um, what, I know that it's important. Do you, what is something in particular, Maybe ju- maybe that is the case, and just to reiterate again, but or something different. What are you looking for in particular for season two of the league's growth? Um, mm-hmm. Just kind of as it progresses and builds towards its future of kind of expanding outward. Um, I think one is quarterback play. You know, when I talked to a lot of the head coaches, that was one area where they felt like there needed to be a, a step up in mm-hmm. development, uh, so that they could get more consistent play overall in the league. And so I think. Some of the, the coaches I talked to are hopeful that they'll get more consistent quarterback play. And then, therefore, we could see more points and just, you know, better games overall, you know, less turnovers, those kind of things. So I think that's one thing to look for. Um, and I think just kind of a continuation of, of guys developing and, and making that leap to the NFL. You know, the fact that you had somebody like Kevontae Turpin have the kind of year that he had in the USFL and then it translated to the NFL tells you if you're a player playing this league that 
it's a possibility that it could happen. You know, Victor Bolden, you know, caught on with the Cardinals and was on their practice squad and uh, was with the Broncos for a little bit of time. Um, Demarcus Gates, you know, with the Bears. Uh, mm-hmm. Odom got signed by, by the Browns. There were a number of players that either got invited to, to you know, 90-man rosters for training camp or somehow made uh, either the active roster or made the practice squad. So uh, just the idea that that's still a possibility. Um, you know, I covered the NFL for over a decade, and I always wondered about, you know, guys that got cut during final roster cuts. Was there a place where they could kind of continue to play and continue to kind of have that dream and hope? And actually Channing Scribbling was with the Chargers, you know, when I was covering that team. So there's a guy that's actually getting – the opportunity to continue to play. He's a good football player. He's, he's the, your, you know, your, your, your 54th man on a roster. Uh, but now he's getting an opportunity to, to continue to make money and, and, and play something, you know, that he enjoys doing. You, you brought some, you know what you just brought up something that I like talking about with these alternative leagues. I think that's something I always have an interesting conversation with some football fans, whether it's college or NFL, I think, and this is more a college one, I think is I, I, I see a lot of college fans that they talk about these great players in the college spectrum. And then, you know, they, they go in and try and get to the NFL. And then it's just kind of, you know, I think a lot of them ask, well, where did they go? You know, or they're like, well, Hey, wait a minute. This guy was a good player. Why is he, why is he fighting to get on a practice squad roster? And like, to me, that question to me is like one of the greatest benefits of spring football is like, if you like, if you love some of these guys that you were following, you know, and you felt like they didn't get that shot, you can now get reinterested in that. You know, I, I feel like, because I, I don't know, I, I talk with college fans and I'm, I'm like, man, we, ch- we turn so much talent out of the college system. And then we seem to forget where these guys are at or how good they were. And we mm-hmm. get to see them again. Like Scooby right to me is the perfect fit in this conversation. Someone that dominated Arizona and now has gone league to league to league and now here in season two and just continuously is that high level of production for someone that, you know, I think has, is building his own persona through a different set of football circumstances. That's not an NFL level, you know, shark dogs, a thing now it's people know what it is <laughs> and that's thanks it's to the USFL. Cool. And, and you get to see kind of his personality and, and charisma kind of emerge in a place where maybe you wouldn't have saw that in the league because he would have been a practice squad guy or, or wouldn't have been able to, to, to be a consistent performer at that level, but he's still a pretty good player. And he's still an entertaining player to watch. And so I think that's what that's the cool thing about the USFL and these other uh, minor league teams is you're getting to see guys that are really talented football players, maybe not elite talent, but still really good football players continue to do their thing and continue to, to entertain us. Okay, Eric, before I let you go, you've been doing predictions all off season. Now I'm going to ask a big one that I think maybe, maybe not championship. I'll, I'll leave that one alone. Cause that's kind of big. And I think there's still, we, we'll we let go the, there. Well, I mean, if you want, I, I, I got two of them. <laughs> we'll do two. I, I was going to give okay. you one, one that I think maybe a little more, a little less of the stakes. Um, okay. I'll, I'll go, I'll leave the championship one last first off though, which team that didn't make the playoffs. And we'll talk, Ooh. we'll even count the showboats that were the bandits in this case last year. Which of the four non-playoffs last year do you see as the biggest leap or the one that you have the most confidence in getting to the playoffs in 2023? Okay, so Bandits slash Showboats, Maulers, um, Gamblers. What's the fourth one? Uh, Panthers. Yeah, so, yeah, Panthers, my guys. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to be a homer here, but I'm, I'm actually going to go with the Panthers. Oh. Uh, just because I have a lot of respect for Nolan. I know that they'll be buttoned down defensively and I think they'll be good enough offensively that they'll win some kind of gritty low scoring games and, and win just enough to, to maybe sneak in and get that, that four, that second spot in the North. So yeah, I, I, I like, uh, that's generals and, and stars though. Right. Two pretty yeah. Good I teams. mean, that, that's a hard division. That's the thing. <laughs> the North to me is the most competitive of the two divisions this year in my eyes. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be a hard ask, but still I'll stick with the Panthers. Oh, okay. You heard it here, folks. He, he said himself, this isn't me. <laughs> yeah. I just, I have a lot of respect for Mike Nolan. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to what Mike Nolan can do in year one with Michigan. I mean, and I love that he's been out and about in the community already. I mean, they're Mm -hmm. doing a great job out there in Detroit, getting things all set up. I'm going to, this is a final one though. And like I said, championship, you know, and it's going to be kind of hard. You, you know, like I said, we're, we're talking biggest leap, possible playoffs for the Panthers, but there's a general still there. And then the stars in the North and also the Maulers are making some leaps too in roster. And then you got the South, which, you know, we've talked about, what can you say about the stallions, the breakers, Mm -hmm. you know, the showboats have shown some pretty highlights in course. And you got a lot of, I think some questions with the gamblers, but potential with the gamblers. Yes. Who do you have as your champion? I'm going to go with um, Stars and Breakers. Okay. And Stars. All right. Yeah. I just, I, Case Kukas is, uh, it's going to be tough to beat, I think. It'd be the first, it looks like that Kukas will be the first to get revenge for all those tragedies in Philadelphia over the sports <laughs> scene last year. That's right. <laughs> A lot of second place finishes. Huh? I know, right? I, I like those odds. Those odds, though. Breakers, though, that, that one to me, I, I, I think, I think, the, like you're saying, depending on the X factor, if things pan out, I'm not. I wouldn't be shocked though. Wouldn't yeah. be shocked at that. Hard to pick against the Stallions, especially with a lot of their guys coming back. Um, I just think the Breakers are pretty talented, and uh, and 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 I think it's also hard once you've won the championship to go back and and have everything go right and do that again. Good point. That's a very good point, Eric. Appreciate the time before we leave. Obviously, where, where can we find you on Fo- Fox Sports? Um, what what do you got coming up for it for us? Maybe on Fox Sports, you have anything to tease? Yeah, I'm doing a couple previews one on the Houston Texans and one on the Memphis Showboats. And then I will be at Memphis this weekend, uh, covering um, Memphis and Philadelphia, and I think Houston and Michigan on, on you, Sunday. So I'll be you covering might run in, those- you might run into me there, Eric. We have the oh. grudge game on okay. sunday so well, i'll be at the rendezvous so if, you, if you're interested in doing barbecue that's that's my spot in memphis okay gonna keep that in mind folks we might have we might have a link up on social you'll be seeing pretty soon e- eric uh whether i'm whether we run into each other or not i'm glad we got to talk today um can't thank you enough appreciate your time and can't wait to see what you what your next with your next write-up and just what's ahead for the season thank you very much Awesome. Thanks for having me, Zach. Appreciate it. Enjoy the conversation.